Yeah, I work for the Green Mountain and the Finger Lakes National Forest, and uh, right out, out there is the National Forest and some pieces of it along the Battenkill. Um, I am uh, what we call a natural resources staff officer for the, for the Green Mountain National Forest, and under my purview is, are, are all the natural resource programs, um, timber and fire and botany and wildlife and fisheries and watershed and all things that I'm not an expert in. Um, but I was a fisheries biologist for a number of years, and um, so uh, I reached back to that experience um, to present today. And I was peripheral to a lot of the work that went on that I'm going to talk about. Um, I was working up out of our Rochester office and came down to the Batten Kill to help out now and again. But um, my predecessor, Steve Roy, um, I'll talk a little bit about how the Forest Service was involved and Ken Cox uh, were the real... Um, uh, movers and shakers of moving um, the bat kill forward. So without further ado, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, all fish that you see in this were treated humanely and they were, most of them, actually all of them were anesthetized and then released. Um, they're just great fish pictures from all, um, all save for one, uh, one angled fish in the picture. Um, they're all part of our population estimate work that we've um, done on the bat and kill. <clears throat> um, Fabled history of the Batten Kill, you all know, and that's why you're here. It's an incredible resource. Um, amazing, it's been that way for a long time. Uh, wild trout fishery, catch and release, um, just an amazing resource. Beautiful, super productive, incredible spring fed temperatures, a river of this size, going down into um, the lower main stem and through New York, being able to sustain trout um, populations in a river that big in New England um, is really really impressive. Uh, so it's a great resource and you know that, um, but it was not without its um, challenges. Um, back in the 90s, anglers as well as fishery scientists um, started noticing a precipitous decline in the uh, trout population, specifically the larger trout that um, anglers really like to catch. And the numbers were going down and people were pointing at different things and wondering what was going on. And, and I think, um, really started to talk about what, what's going on and what are the things, what are the limiting factors? What is driving this decline of, uh, of the wild brown trout and brook trout populations in the batten kill? Um, so, you know, you ask a hundred anglers or, or uh, fisheries enthusiasts and a hundred um, biologists, you know, what do you think the problem is? And they'll give you, well, maybe not a hundred, but they'll give you maybe dozens of possibilities of what could really be going wrong with with the fisheries um, in, in any particular watershed. I feel like I'm in your way a little bit here. So. Right. Um, you know, they might talk about chemicals and pollutants and sediment and temperature and the habitat, uh, the geomorphology, how rivers have been straightened and burned, um, predation, what's eating the trout that we want to be catching. Um, is there still a good strong food source in the river um, to sustain the population or have we exceeded the carrying capacity? Um, Disease, are there disease that, diseases killing uh, parasites, killing fish? You can point to lots of different potential limiting factors. And that's what we were doing at that time is thinking, what could this be? What could be causing this? And we got um, Ken Cox and the state and forest service uh, assisting, uh, kept looking at the population numbers and seeing the decline. And to figure out what really the limiting factor is, you have to think about um, the life history of the trout and where that bottleneck in the population is happening. So you've got on the right side the adult fish, and you've got a couple of spawners, a male and a female there. And so then you have spawning, you have the eggs, and you have the alvin, that's when they're really little. They have a yolk sac and they're living in the gravel for a few weeks before they emerge as fry up into the water column, start feeding on benthic macroinvertebrates. And then after a year, we call them yearling. Before that, they're young of the year. Um, and then you sort of have that up at the top there, those sub-adult or juvenile, or I call them teenage fish, where they're in that, that, that in-between size. Uh, so looking at the population dynamics that we had in the, in the bat and kill, it was that teenage year, that, that uh, yearling and a little bit older size fish that were just kind of, the numbers were going down there. If you don't have those numbers, then they're not recruiting into the adult size and the larger size. So that became a clue as to what was happening. It wasn't so much the success of spawning, the success of eggs or, or fry. Uh, it was those middle years that we were kind of dropping out of the population. 
So that was a clue, and it helped to identify, think about um, what we needed to do to bring um, these numbers back up of, of large adult trout. This fish was caught at the Habitat um, Project at Cemetery Run um, last spring. Um, had a beautiful fish, and that's what we wanted to try to achieve. So we looked around for resources. Um, the state, of course, had a, a champion in the U.S. Congress, Jim Jeffords, who knew the value of Matt Kill uh, watershed as sort of um, fishing heritage and as an economic resource, a community resource um, for, um, for Vermont. Um, he uh, pulled some strings and funneled about $350,000 over a five-year period into the Forest Service, who had the ability to then deliver that, um, those funds out to partners in this, in this effort. Um, and then a technical team was pulled together, um, a Fish and Wildlife uh, Department, uh, fishery biologist for the state, Forest Service, uh, Steve Roy was the uh, fisheries program manager at the time, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the um, Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Unit at the U at University of Vermont uh, was on board, and the Department of Environmental Conservation in Vermont, um, primarily their rivers and watershed program. Those technical experts came together and began to think about all those limiting factors that were potential, sediment, disease, predation, uh, chemicals, and that how can we evaluate these? So with that $350,000, um, they started moving forward with um, a variety of, of, of efforts. Um, 26 miles of habitat was inventory on seven tributaries and the main stem. Um, there were five miles of riparian planting, riparian protection, and in-stream habitat work done in that period. 18 miles of the river was assessed for its uh, geomorphic uh, stability. How much of it has been straightened or burned or relocated? Uh, there are 14 different uh, studies going on, um, biological studies to investigate all those limiting factors. And that was all being done with this $350,000 of seed money, but that seed money uh, went out to our partners in this and they matched that money. So it ended up as over $750,000 going into this study and evaluation and restoration efforts on, uh, on the Batten Kill. So I'll talk briefly about just a couple of those things that had, you know, you might call them a smoking gun or maybe there's just a wisp of smoke coming out of the gun. Not a lot, it might not be the silver bullet that is gonna fix the river, um, fix the fishery. But here's a picture of um, the Batten Kill with uh, Route 113 on one side and River Road on the other. And you can see the, the Batten Kill has been, it's in a narrow valley to begin with, but it's been straightened and put right along the, the highway uh, for many miles of it. And when you straighten a river, you stop the meanders, and those meanders are where you get deep pools, and you get overwinter habitat, you get adult habitat, etc. So that is something that has affected the habitat. But that happened decades, decades ago. So that was going on even before the population decline happened. So yeah, it has an impact, but probably not a real, not a lot of smoke coming out of that gun. Also, sediment is a really, um, can be a really damaging uh, fine sediment uh, to a fishery. It can smother eggs in the gravel. Um, it can entomb um, those alvin when they've invert or hatch, but they can't get out of the gravel and become fry. Um, it can smother um, an embedded substrate so you don't get as much insect life growing. So we looked at a few of the, the large sediment sources, these big mass failures along the, uh, along the upper Batten Kill by the Roaring Ranch and by, uh, I think that one's by the, uh, by the waste treatment uh, plant. And we actually measured how much of that slope was moving um, each year and calculated the cubic yards of sediment that were going downstream. It's like, wow, it was a lot, but was it enough to really affect um, 50 miles of the, of the main stem of the, of the river? Probably not. Again, a little bit of smoke coming out of that gun, but not the big deal. Um, we looked at temperatures. Uh, this is a 2001 profile of two sites, one the, um, in the East Dorset, uh, pretty much upper uh, part of the uh, headwater uh, of the main stem, and then the cemetery run. And you can see uh, the 20 degrees Celsius mark there. It's, it's a very healthy temperature. All those temperatures are below that. Uh, and that's something in the range of 65 degrees or something like that. 
Um, so super healthy temperatures up in East Dorset. You get down to the Cemetery Run, you've got a few of those bars. Each one of those bars, it's a daily, so there's a daily max of the temperature. Um, there can be quite a bit of fluctuation within a day, um, several degrees, 10 degrees from morning to late in the afternoon. Now you see some of those spike up to 25 degrees, so that's getting up in the 70 degree temperature. A little, little dicey, but the temperature goes back down at night, and trout have a great ability to find those little cold seeps and spots to get them through a day or two of that. Other than that, cemetery runs, we've got beautiful temperatures, um, even for brook trout, um, mostly in the high 60s, below 72 mark, which starts to be a little bit stressful for brook trout. Browns take a little bit, bit warmer. So yeah, temperature wasn't, wasn't a big deal. Um, uh, thought well, they were pretty healthy. We also looked at, at predators. Um, uh, these big brown trout are piscivorous. They'll, they'll eat, eat their own. Um, and mergansers, if you've spent time on the river, you've seen them, you've seen the size of their broods. You know, six, eight, 12, 14 of these little fish eating machines going up and down the river was of interest. Um, so we, we um, pumped the stomachs of some of these critters to see what was in them. Um, and we weren't quite able to get Smokey uh, to cough up um, his summer stomach contents, but the mergansers and the large trout definitely eat smaller fish. Um, some of it are uh, minnows and um, sculpin, things like that, but definitely some, some trout in, those, in their diets isn't enough to really cause that decline of those teenage sized fish, you know, that are from you know, six inches, 10 inches? Maybe not, probably not. Is it a piece of it? Maybe. The other thing we looked at was, was in-stream habitat, cover for, for trout. Um, this is where it got really interesting. Um, Ken Cox and the other state biologists teamed up to do a study. They looked at um, the bat and kill uh, section of the Baton Kill, section of the Dog River, uh, Pulteney, Pulteney and the Meadowy looked at areas that had wild brown trout and brook trout, and they assessed how much cover was in the stream and tried to correlate how healthy the trout population was, the standing crop, pounds per acre, and correlate that with the amount of cover that was in the, in the stream. Um, I'm going to keep uh, my timer so I don't take up Courtney's. Um, and this was really interesting. They found that um, the bat and kill had about 7% cover habitat. And that was average throughout all the reaches. Um, the, the literature says brown trout like 20%, 20% cover, even up to 50% cover if they can get it. The more, the better. Um, so 7% was pretty low. Um, so they looked at that um, and they did a little analysis and it was significant positive correlation of cover and trout standing crop um, for brook trout, but less so for brown trout. But it also it showed that it wasn't every year and it wasn't every river that that happened. And I think it was an astute observation um, that there are other factors that contribute in other years. Streams are such a dynamic, rivers are such a dynamic habitat for a critter to, to, to have to survive in year to year with temperatures and flows um, that um, it's, really, it's really hard to pin down what is driving a population decline. But this was something that could be tested um, with a hypothesis that says if you put more habitat in, uh, more cover, will you get more fish? And that's what the, the group decided to do and move forward with some habitat in-stream restoration. And it's not that we said all the other things can just go away, that sediment isn't important. Um, we tried, <clears throat> we did um, stabilize some of the tow of those uh, mass failures to reduce that sediment. Um, we worked with volunteers and landowners to plant riparian uh, buffers uh, along the river, and that would both intercept um, sediment and pollutants from, from runoff. It would provide um, organic material into the river and someday provide that, those trees into the river that would provide that cover naturally. So we did um, all those things at the same time that we began to look at cover and putting cover into the stream as, um, as a, trying to determine if it was a, um, a limiting factor. Um, so we had, we had the data that said um, numbers were going down, trout numbers were going down. Uh, we looked at that and turned it into information that 
it's this particular year classes that are depleting. Um, and then we uh, looked at other limiting factors and came up with you know, knowledge. And I'll say that that's sort of the, the way it works is you get the data, you turn it into information, you turn that into knowledge, and then hopefully you turn that into wisdom. And I will I'll leave my last point is that in, um, in adding cover to the stream, we're mimicking something that should be happening naturally. Um, and that is that tree should be falling into the river um, naturally along the entire Battenkill, along all of our streams. So if we can be wise and maintain those riparian buffers to s s filter out the sediment, to filter out the pollutants, to provide organic material to the, to the streams, to provide that cover by trees falling into the river in the future, then I think we'll be um, doing ourselves and our and the future generations a, a great service. Um, that would be the wise use of the uh, riparian along the Batten Kill. So with that, I'm going to leave the remaining part of this 50 minute to, to Courtney. And um, I think, uh, Bill, are you going to introduce Courtney? Or? Uh, you can do it you want. All right. Courtney. <laughs> uh, Courtney is the um, fisheries biologist with, uh, with the um, uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. And she works out of the Springfield office, right? And, and the Batten Kill is one of the watersheds that uh, she works in and is um, becoming very familiar with. So Courtney's gonna pick up where um, I left off about this uh, um, idea of adding cover and evaluating the effectiveness of it. So, take away, Courtney. Hi everyone, I'm Courtney Buckley. I'm the fisheries biologist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. I've been here just about two and a half years and stepping into some pretty big shoes. Uh, if you're all familiar with Ken Cox, he was here um, for many years and um, did a really good job. It's not intimidating at all uh, to step into his shoes, but I'm gonna pick up, like I said, where Dan said, where he left off, um, going into a little bit about what we've learned after the uh, wood additions that were done on the main stem bat and kill, and a little bit more about what that means for trout. Um, so like we like to say, fish grow on trees. That kind of has led into um, the limiting factors, all the studies that Dan has already covered, um, what fish need. So on the bat and kill, we have both brook and brown trout. Um, they have different needs. Brook trout are um, a little bit more widespread in the types of habitats they like. So they'll be in some of those high gradient, um, faster flowing waters up at higher elevations in the headwaters. And they'll also be in low gradient, slower moving um, streams. Um, and kind of everywhere in between beaver ponds, uh, different lakes and ponds. Um, I know people are usually surprised finding them in just kind of uh, small streams along roadways or in farm fields. They, they really do well as long as they have cold water. Um, brown trout are a little bit more selective. They more enjoy slower moving, low gradient, um, very similar to what we have in the main stem batten kill, which is why here in the batten kill, uh, uh, brown trout are king. The batten kill is obviously known for their brown trout. Um, they grow to very large sizes, up to 20 or more inches. Um, they're also a little bit more picky in what they're gonna eat, which will translate to why uh, the Batten Kill is also a tricky uh, river to fish. Um, whereas brook trout, they're a little bit more aggressive eaters. They will eat any um, sort of invertebrates, uh, aquatic insects. Brown trout will start there when they're smaller, but once they get to adult sizes, they actually will move to um, smaller fish or crustaceans. So they feed on different things. Um, they tend to, if they're in the same areas, fall out into um, the brown trout staying more in the deeper pools and the brook trout staying kind of in the riffle, like on the edge of the riffle habitats. Um, 
the reason that we have such good trout in Vermont, and here is distributions of wild trout throughout Vermont with brook trout on the far left in the pink um, and brown trout in the center in the yellow. This is every occurrence um, or where we anticipate those species of trout to be throughout Vermont. The reason that we have such good trout is because we have a lot of cold groundwater, a lot of natural springs that come out of um, the mountains and up well from our uh, aquifers and our groundwater. And that allows our streams, the small ones up at high gradient and the lower ones to stay wet year round and also stay with enough flow that fish can stay there and aren't being pushed out. Um, Like I kind of have alluded to and uh, Dan covered, um, temperature is really, really important for trout, um, especially brook trout. They are, I think I kind of go into, oops. Uh, they are the most sensitive to any sort of temperature changes. So that's why we're sort of seeing preliminary evidence that as climate change happens as water temperatures start to warm, we're seeing a slight decrease in our brook trout populations in main stems where water is collecting from all the headwaters and kind of getting a little bit warmer. Um, but that's also really good for the brown trout. They don't have the competition. They're a little bit more um, tolerant of water, warmer temperatures. So brook trout, anything over 68, they start to get stressed. Um, their, their goal is to be in 55 to 65 degrees or colder. Um, once you get over about 72 degrees, they can't stay there for more than a few hours and it's actually lethal. So they find these upwelling areas, these small um, cold water seepages and higher elevation streams where water is gonna be a bit colder. Um, for brown trout, they are, Similar, they like 68, about 70 degrees. Once you start getting to the upper 70s, that's when they start to be a little stressed. Um, I won't really go into rainbow trout here because uh, we don't have rainbow trout in the bat and kill. <laughs> uh, there was an occurrence, but it was an overflow of uh, uh, someone's pond. And that was a little confusing for a bit, but we figured it out. So, what, going off of what Dan, Dan said, uh, it's all about habitat. It's all about cover um, and temperature. So what trout really, really enjoy is a diverse amount of habitat. So a good complex uh, balance of pools and riffles. Um, so like in this photo, you have some of these uh, step pools on the edges of those, you'll have shallower water. Um, that's usually where the younger fish hang out. They don't wanna be so much in the very fast flow because they're not strong enough to spend a lot of time there. But the adults will sit in that fast flowing water. So if you have a diverse amount of habitat with different um, depths, different sediments, um, that really provides a great canvas for all of your different age classes, all the different species to coexist. What's also really important about this photo is the amount of trees. Um, I'll say it again, fish grow on trees. It's not only the, the wood that's in the stream, but it's also the shading of these trees. So it keeps the water cold. If you think about being in your backyard, you know, you're gonna wanna, uh, on a hot day, sit under a tree or an umbrella, something that is just gonna keep you a little bit more comfortable. And you know, you could sit out there and roast all day and the fish don't like that either. Um, which goes into, for our high quality of life, uh, I'll just go through all of that. Um, us and fish have the same similar needs. So the way that we do really well when we have an adequate home, when we feel safe, um, we're not exposed to the elements, we're not worried about predators um, getting to us. When we have ample food supply, so just availability of food, um, 
and comfort, like I said, sitting out in your backyard, maybe under a tree, much more comfortable than roasting in the sun. Fish are very similar. Our houses look different, but they need the same exact thing. So they need that structure, which uh, I appreciate Dan saying, you know, the bat and kill had 7% structure. That's like if you had, you know, 7% of a house, maybe. Um, you wouldn't really feel very comfortable to grow adequately, optimally, and then to think about like even having enough energy to think about children, maybe, right? You wanna be financially stable, comfortable before you're able to do that. So for fish, trees, boulders, undercut banks, those are gonna be all of those shelters that fish will spend a lot of their time on. As fly fishermen, I'm sure everyone's aware that when you're looking to you know, throw a line in, you're gonna hit those fish off of some sort of structure um, or a deep pool, right? So if it's a, a flat riffle, your likelihood of actually catching a fish there is a little bit lower. Safety goes into the predation. So the uh, birds, other fish, us, um, having those structures just helps the fish be more, less stressed, more comfortable, safer. Um, they also accumulate a lot of food. So a lot of those insects end up shredding all the leaf litter, all of the debris that, um, we don't like to call it debris, but that's uh, similar to what it is. All of that is the base layer for all of those insects, all of those crustaceans, that's what they're eating. So if they have enough food source, like dead or submerged trees, all of the leaves and um, organic material that's growing there, they're gonna be there and then fish will sit on those structures and wait for the water to bring those, uh, bring those insects to them. They are opportunistic feeders, so they're usually sitting and waiting for something to flo float by. Um, and as I said, comfort, those temperatures are really, really important. Keeping those waters cold is uh, extremely important to uh, both brook and brown trout. Um, so like I was saying, the, the best fish houses are complex, cold, and connected. So here we have some trees that have fallen in. Um, and you can see just all of the aggradation, or all the collection of the sediment uh, that is both above and below these trees. So it slows down the flow, which also um, allows fish to take a break. If we have really high flow events, um, they can find safety, uh, a place to kind of take a break around these structures. And it also holds sediment. So. What we'd also looked at is these uh, slumps, these bank failures, and as sediment is moving through the system, these, this wood also is providing like a strainer. It's something that the uh, sediment is going to slow down, settle out, and stay there instead of moving farther downstream where it could um, possibly blanket or um, smother out uh, our egg, uh, our trout eggs. So I won't go too much into this, but um, in the 90s, there was you know, this decline of trout in the bat and kill. There was a lot of concern as to why that was happening, especially for such a famed uh, river that everyone knows really well, everyone really loves and cares about. You start to get a little nervous when you're not catching fish, what's going on. And Dan did a great job of outlining all of the concerns, all the threats that we um, wanted to look into to see what was causing those declines um, and found that it was that shelter, all of that um, habitat, the, the trees in the streams. So we have uh, gone now um, into doing more widespread statewide um, assessments of in-stream habitat, uh, doing wood counts and seeing exactly how many pieces of large wood and the cover analysis for our streams. Um, Vermont has a long history of um, agricultural land use, um, a lot of tree cutting um, and 
log drives. So all of that wood that would have naturally been occurring, trees growing along the streams were cut down historically. Um, rivers were straightened and um, all of that wood, anything that was gonna block uh, goods or uh, lumber from being floated downstream was removed. So really what we're doing is now trying to go back, restore what the natural condition of streams would have been um, and doing that by felling trees. So if you build it, they will come. It's this idea of you can only have a population that is supported by the availability of housing. So your, your population, if you move into a new town, I know with the you know, pandemic and the housing market and you know, rent prices now, something we can all kind of relate to timely. Um, but with the influx of people that want to move to Vermont, they're, you know, it's kind of limited based on the amount of available housing or the quality of housing. And it's the exact same thing for fish. Um, and what we're doing is creating more housing, better uh, quality housing. And in the uh, Northeast Kingdom, um, Judd Kratzer has uh, written our handbook on strategic wood addition and um, has been working with TU and other partners and is celebrating uh, about 10 years of doing this type of work. They've covered um, and restored 50 miles of stream habitat, which is very exciting. He was uh, excited to like actually look into it and look up the numbers. It's, um, uh, you know, helpful to do that instead of getting bogged down in the, the day to day and found that for all of that work he was doing on average, the amount of trout that were found on those uh, sites increased by about two and a half, um, two and a half times what was there previously. He also found that it wasn't only on the site directly where the wood was put, but sites upstream and downstream that wood wasn't added actually had an increase in population also. So as those houses are created, fish can move into them. That opens up other habitat for fish to move in. And then they uh, have better food, better comfort. They're able to have better and uh, more healthy progeny. And that uh, adds to population increase. So of the about 50 miles of stream over the last 10 years, um, he estimated that through all of that work, they're actually increasing the number of brook trout by 60,000 um, annually. So it's, you know, working. The issue is that these, um, these types of projects, uh, we're not sure what the longevity of them are. His have been around, like I said, for about 10 years. So far, they're holding up fairly well, as long as they uh, remain submerged, they're not rotting out, um, and we don't have uh, very high flow events that are pushing that wood, um, kind of displacing it out of those areas. So what we're doing, in, this is like more of a uh, short-term immediate benefit, but as we've evaluated this, we're, we're really trying to focus now on um, expanding our riparian areas, those vegetated stream banks, making our riparian buffers. So that strainer between you know, your house or the road um, and the stream wider, more thickly vegetated. So um, I think I'm running a little bit uh, short on time, but I have all of this on my poster. Uh, so we can talk about it more in detail, but we had done, like Dan said, the wood addition at the Twin River site and then had uh, the Cemetery Run and West Mountain control sites to compare to. I'll have that in a very nice um, graph uh, on my poster. Um, but what we were seeing is we did the um, restoration in 2006, 2007. Uh, I say we as in Fish and Wildlife, not me personally. I was not here. Um, but what I thought was really interesting, here you have the, the years that we've sampled, the Twin River site, so that's the area where wood was added. Um, and the number of fish being the blue, being brook trout, gray being brown trout, 
um, and how they've responded to that wood addition over time. Um, we don't have information on the specific site previous to 2005 because that was the year before um, they did the wood addition. We do have information on the other two control sites. So if you're looking for um, previous information, like I said, I'll have that um, later. But as you can see, the brown trout have been doing really well, responding well to this um, wood addition. They, um, the brook trout, which was interesting, I spent a lot of time trying to dig into uh, why there's a slight decrease or um, decrease in the brook trout over time. Um, and I, I believe that that is due to the habitat type. Um, temperatures are still really good. They're, they're within, we have a temperature logger at this site that takes temperature all season long. Um, it's well within uh, temperatures that brook trout are comfortable with. Um, I believe that this is more to do with it being a large um, river. It's about 80 feet wide at this, this section. Uh, it's more of a pool habitat, a little bit more of that slow flow um, pool that br brown trout really enjoy. Um, but it's been uh, very variable, and I'm sure that everyone has been out here uh, fishing. We know that we had the drought um, two summers ago, and then that was followed by really, really high flows last year. Uh, so it's really hard to say anything about trends in trout populations uh, when you're working in a really highly variable uh, system. But something I'm looking into or want to look into is how those flows um, have impacted the young of year or the recruitment of the next year's um, uh, trout. Uh, so I'm digging into that. Uh, this was just a breakout of the, the difference between the young of year and fish over six inches. Um, I will have that also uh, later, so I'll skip through that. But as I said, what we're really doing, and I'm really grateful to have Jacob and the, the Home Rivers Initiative mm. through TU here, um, all of that work that Judd was doing in the Northeast Kingdom, those 50 miles of stream restoration, could not have been done without their own Home Rivers Initiative um, through TU. They partnered really closely on that and have continued to work together. Um, I am one person. Uh, we all feel like, you know, we cover so much ground. It's really, really important to me to have these collaborative partners um, help spread the word, uh, spread the work, and then also collaborate on really, really great projects together. Um, so the plan now is to reach out to private landowners. About 80% of our stream side land is privately owned. Um, that is a huge amount of land in Vermont and we really want to get that as shaded, as stabilized with natural trees as possible. And I think I showed uh, pretty well that these trees actually do increase trout populations. So fish grow on trees. And to be a really good steward, um, what we're trying to do is add wood directly to the stream, leave wood that has already fallen in, let, because that's exactly what it's supposed to do, um, let that wood lie. And then as we plan for the future, start planting trees so that that natural process can continue to happen. Um, and hopefully uh, we won't have to be actually cutting the trees anymore. They'll be doing it on their own. Um, so with that, I will take any questions.